Hey there, amazing audience who have joined the revolving time today. Get ready to embark on an unforgettable adventure with us. Subscribe now and let's uncover the hidden secrets and truths together. Discovering that someone you trusted has deceived you can feel like a tidal wave of emotions crashing down. The hurt, anger, and confusion can be overwhelming. But let me tell you, this moment does not define who you are or your worth. Well my friends, today's story is published by QHML1. My wife of 32 years has turned into a cheating slot wife. She became involved with a doctor and then left home. Now she's regretting and begging to come back. Well let's start the part 2 and see consequences of her infidelity. If you haven't seen part 1 of this story, see the top comment or description. There's a link. Are you ready? Update. I looked over at my lawyer, remembering again how much she looked like my freshman science teacher. I told her that once and I think she didn't like it, until I told her she was the hottest teacher in school. We were in her conference room. I was pacing while she sat on the table swinging one long stockinged leg, her three-inch heel dangling from her toe. I grinned. She noticed. What was that about? She sat on the conference table, swinging her long, stockinged leg, shoe dangling. A seductress, hidden in a business suit, waiting to pounce on her next victim. Does she do it on purpose? Or does all that suppressed sexuality demand release at odd and inopportune times? How does sound as a passage in one of my stories? She blushed a little and grinned wickedly, swishing her skirt high enough to make sure I knew she had on thigh highs. She was 43, looked 33, and acted 25 when she wasn't working. We had developed an easy friendship over the last few months. You better make her prettier than me. My prose isn't that good. Impossible you know, to improve on perfection, Becky dear. She actually blushed again. You're a dirty old man disguised as a writer. I've become many things over the past months. An admirer of beauty, for instance. Stop it. It's gonna be hard enough to keep a straight face as it is. Behave. And remember, watch me. If I don't like what you're saying, I'll give you a head shake. Her assistant opened the door. They've arrived. I put on the coffee. Water will be in the bar fridge. Becky looked at me. Ready, as I'll ever be. Showtime. Sheila didn't look so hot. She had gained the weight she'd lost back since I had seen her last, plus a few pounds. Her hair was pulled back with a band, not a good look for her. I had no idea how I looked to her. I had grown my mustaches and goatee out until I looked like a shaven-headed buffalo bill. I liked it. And one thing about having money, even a little, is that most times you only have to impress yourself. I was leaner than she saw me last, in better shape. Golf in my home gym took care of that. I looked at her and tried to remember the hot coed I had bedded in college. I had showed Kelsey a photo I had of her then, wearing cutoffs and a thin halter top, smiling that killer smile as her hair swirled in the wind. I think it was the first time she realized we weren't born old. Gramps, she was hot. I totally agreed. What really threw her was a picture of me. She looked at it and asked who it was. I had on a tidy t-shirt, bell bottoms with a huge flare, had a beard, wire rim glasses and hair past my shoulders. I laughed. It was the early 70s, baby. Look it up. I was pretty average back then. She took both pictures home with her. I smiled at the thought of her then and she misread it, thinking it was for her now. She smiled back. I put my serious face on, determined to get this over with. She looked apprehensive and nervous again. Becky thanked them for coming, offering them water or coffee. I waited until they were seated, then took a seat opposite. Becky cleared her throat. If you're ready, we'll discuss the settlement agreement first. Sheila spoke up before her lawyer could stop her. I don't want a settlement. I want my husband back. I shocked them all, I think, when I asked her why. Why do you want me back now? After you made our last two years HLL, left like a thief in the night, hide from me, took half our money, all so you could duck another man. You said you were looking for yourself. Tell me, Sheila, did you find yourself on the end of his sea? Has he left you yet? Did you hit your expiration date? If you like, I can show you my investigator's report. You weren't the first nurse to keep the lonely doctor company while his wife traveled. She sobbed and Becky shushed me. You're not helping things, Roy. I thought I could control my temper, but couldn't. I'm not here to help. I'm here to end things so I can go on with my life. I'm sure Sheila wants to get on with finding herself. This should help her. We took a break and she took me out in the hall and ate me up. Her finger was in my face. Another outburst like that, and you'll need new representation. Now, promise me you'll stick to the game plan. I apologized and we went back in. Sheila tried to get everyone back on track. Mrs. Smith, I'm very sorry, but her husband just does not want to continue this marriage. He's a fair man and really doesn't want you to suffer. We all make mistakes and have to live with them. He's willing to split all assets evenly and is also willing to give you the house if you wish it. Is there anything in particular you want? Sheila had managed to remain calm. I want my life back. 
I know I threw it away, but I'm willing to walk through the fires of HLL if that what it takes. I'll quit my job, never leave the house, bow and scrape if I have to. Nobody spoke for a second. I drew in a breath but Becky put her hand over mine. Sheila saw it and her eyes narrowed. To rub it and I took her hand and squeezed it, holding it for a few seconds. Becky caught on and snatched her hand away, frowning. I wasn't helping myself. Her lawyer spoke for the first time. The whole reason we agreed to this sit-down was for my client to have a 30-minute conversation with her husband. She freely admits her affair and lack of reasonable behavior, but there were extenuating circumstances. If she isn't going to be allowed that chance, we'll leave, counselor, and see you in court. Becky became placating again. My client will honor this agreement if you honor yours. In this envelope is full disclosure of my client's finances. I think yours will be surprised. Also, the conversation will be recorded and we will each take a tape immediately after. Agreed. He didn't like it, but it was in the agreement. They left, placing two cassette recorders on the table. Becky pulled a timer out of the sideboard and handed it to me. I set it for 30 minutes and started it as soon as the door closed. She didn't say anything for a few minutes. Sheila, you've already wasted close to three minutes. If you've got something to say, better start soon. She spent five minutes crying, five minutes explaining, five minutes apologizing, five minutes begging. I answered when I thought it was appropriate. In the end she was exhausted and I stood firm. You know what you haven't said. I'll never do anything like that again. Not in those exact words. And that's what it's gonna take. No why? Because you can't. Our lawyers don't know our history. So, until you can tell me that and I can look in your eyes and believe it, there's never going to be a chance we'll get back together. Please Sheila, we had a good run. Let it go so we can both move on. Please Roy, you can't do that. Try, please. The meeting was pretty much was over then. After Becky stopped chewing me out, I kissed her soundly, apologized sincerely, and invited her and her husband up to the house for the weekend. The lawyer stood, ample chest heaving with emotion, as her enigmatic client strode from the room regretfully, knowing the hot vixen would never be his. Damn morals, he thought. I didn't get to finish the thought as a law book slammed into the wall beside the door, followed by the laughter of Becky and her assistant. I better get royalties, she yelled after me. Update 1. We had become friends over the months. She and her husband were both in their early 40s with a teen daughter. I had them up to the house twice before. Seems her husband Jack was an avid fisherman. And when I mentioned the pontoon boat came with the house he almost salivated. We spent a pleasant morning working the coves, while Becky, her daughter, and Kelsey and a few of her friends sunned. I finally told Kelsey what her determined actions had resulted in, after picking her up from school. She was stunned and thrilled alternately, both at the money and the house. She wandered through it, looking at everything. When she saw the patio layout with the outdoor kitchen she was speechless. I took her down to the little independent grocery. And she watched, thrilled, as a butcher cut meat to her exact specifications. We stopped at a produce stand and bought fresh vegetables to use for sides. After our feast, we sat and talked about her future. Her grades in community college were near perfect. You know, Kelsey, I can afford to send you anywhere you want to go. You get a car and spending money as long as you maintain your grades. Think about it, look around, do what's best for Kelsey. She cried herself to sleep. I gave up trying to get her to stop got a blanket and wrapped it around her to ward off the coolness of the evening, and left her. She stayed with me a week before she went home, swearing not to let anyone know where I was or what I was doing. She was disappointed that her grandmother and I weren't together. She spent the night with her now and then, said she was sad all the time. I never commented. I was a regular at the country club. I made friends, played golf if it was weather fit two or three times a week, and socialized. I ate at the restaurant twice a week on average. I knew the guys at the grocery store, the names of the guys that ran the gas station I used, and a couple of farmers I met while buying produce. I was integrating, becoming part of the community. I was just Roy, the retired guy that bought the Kessler house. When I quit my health insurance stopped, so I used the agent that sold me homeowners and car insurance to set me up with a family policy. I included my son, Kelsey, my ex-daughter-in-law, and Sheila, telling them I got a good rate if I used the family plan. They all bought the story, not wanting to look a gift horse in the mouth. I redid my third book completely, making it a much better read. Miss Nora wasn't surprised when Loveland came calling. Out of loyalty, I made sure she got to publish the book online, dedicating it to her. I don't know if she appreciated it or not, she was the most unemotional woman I had ever met. I did find out she won some kind of award and got a nice promotion later. I like to think I contributed to her success. Sheila and her lawyer got cute trying to renege on their promise to go to arbitration instead of court. I was set to burn her down, make her lose her job, but Becky stopped me, so she loses her job. 
Whoopee. It'll make you feel good for what? Five minutes. Then you'll be divorcing an unemployed housewife instead of a well-paid professional. It'll cost you more than the satisfaction you'll get, paying her alimony. Let's hope she doesn't figure it out and quit for spite. If you lose sight of what you're after, resolution over revenge, it'll get long, costly, and more painful. So I left her alone. But the rumor mill continued to grind, kept alive by her pending divorce. Eventually it got to the point where management had to address it. They gave her and Dr. Feldman a week of paid leave while they considered what to do. Word got out they were going to fire her and give the good doctor a slap on the wrist. Her lawyer called Becky. Becky called me. She, Sheila's attorney, and I paid a little unannounced visit to the director. Becky told him flat out if she was fired lawsuits would descend like an avalanche. We have three affidavits from nurses he had affairs with before Mrs. Smith, evidence he was the aggressor in the relationships, and that inappropriate contact occurred in the workplace. Our clients are determined to file suit if Mrs. Smith is adversely affected. Think of the damage to the image your hospital projects. We intend to name and sue you separately as director for allowing this kind of behavior to occur despite hospital policy. She paused for breath as his eyes got bigger. Or, we could all just go away and let it go, provided Mrs. Smith is treated with respect. But you still might want to do something about Dr. Feldman, before he lands you in a situation that can't be dealt with privately. In the end, to allow them to get rid of Dr. Feldman, they had to demote her. She agreed and became a regular shift nurse. Mrs. Dr. Feldman finally got tired of her husband and transferred to the West Coast to head their operations there. It was a huge promotion, and since she provided the money for their lifestyle, he went from a $3 million estate to a one-bedroom townhouse. He lost his privileges at his old hospital and just barely, thanks to his son, got them at the other hospital in town after agreeing to a probationary period. So now his life semi-sucked. Was I happy about it? Yes, in a way. He deserved it for being a predatory as whole. That being said, my wife was an intelligent woman who could have said no at any time during the seduction. If it hadn't been him, it would have been somebody else. In the end I agreed to three months of marriage counseling, meeting twice weekly and once individually. After it was made ironclad then after that, if I still wanted the divorce it would be granted. Update 2. My therapist didn't like me much. Her name was Dr. Patricia Wills. Her reconciliation rate was a source of great satisfaction to her. She was always smiling, emphatic, and just as irritating as possible. Thank you for agreeing to meet, Roy. I like to keep things informal, so... I held up my hand. You can stop right there Patricia, Patty, Trisha, Trish, whatever you go by. You will address me as Mr. Smith. I will address you as Dr. Wills. This is a business arrangement. We're not friends meeting for drinks after work. Keep it professional. And this will pass much faster for us. She eyed me critically. That's going to make it harder to establish a rapport. It appears to me you don't want to be here. I can go back to the court and... I stopped her again. Dr. Wills, you're not being professional. Have you even read the agreement between my wife and I? These sessions aren't court-ordered, but I did sign a contract agreeing to meet with you for the specified time. Whether I participate, despite what you may recommend, it ends at the agreed-upon time, and if I still want the divorce it becomes automatic. And my lawyer worded the contract very carefully. It says I'm obligated to attend, not participate. That being said, I'm curious about some things so I most likely will participate. Understand, this is important. You have no power over me. You have the same standing my butcher or mechanic at home half. You're a professional I'm using for a specific task. All right. I used up most of my first session establishing my ground rules. She was not happy. I have no idea what her sessions with Sheila was like. Our first two joint sessions were pretty tame, mostly her apologizing. I told the doctor if we didn't get past that I was going to bring a book or tablet to the rest of the sessions. My next individual session she changed gears, having me tell how we fell in love. It was 1972, and I was 18 years old. Barely missing the messiness and destruction of Southeast Asia, I had gotten an academic scholarship to study business. I was always a bit of a wild child, raised in a single-family home after my dad was killed in a car crash. We didn't get much insurance so mom worked long hours in a furniture factory to pay the bills. As soon as I turned 16 I got a job in the same factory, working 4 hours a night Monday through Thursday, 8 hours Friday night, and coming in at 6 in the morning on Saturday to work 6 more. After I had been there a while my boss would let me work an extra hour here and there in full shifts if school was out, so I was basically working 40 hours a week and attending high school at the same time. High school was easy for me, mostly. Loved English, history, and science, wasn't so great at math. When I started working I footed my own bills and took a lot of the burden off mom. 
I bought my own car, clothes, even paid for groceries a lot of times. When you worked the hours I did there wasn't a whole lot of time to spend money. I dated a lot on Saturday nights, but it didn't go anywhere because teen girls liked their boys to talk to them on the phone, go to school events and games during the week, and generally be available. I wasn't. The scholarship came from the company I worked for. I saw a notice on the bulletin board urging workers to have their children apply. My boss saw me looking at it. Got any kids college age? He said with a grin. No, but does it have to be a child? Can it be an employee? He looked at me like it was something no one had ever thought of. I don't see why not. I forgot about it. But three days later the plant manager stopped by on his way home and gave me some papers. What are these? Your scholarship application. Bill said you were interested. It's self-explanatory. Just get your teachers to fill out their part quickly. The faster you get it back, the more time we have to consider you. I didn't think I had a chance in HLL, but my teachers helped me out and I had a good interview with the screening committee. I was still surprised when I got it. Mom was over the moon. Her son, a college man. She showed me a savings account she had started when I was four, just for college. She got to keep most of the money. They paid for everything and got me a part-time job at their local plant. The hours I got to work were tied to my grade average. The higher the average, the more hours I could work. If they dropped, I was practically unemployed. I averaged 24 hours. She did insist on buying me a better car. Like I said, it was 1972, the tail end of the muscle car era. Camaros, Mustangs, GTOs, Chevelles were all popular. My car was a little different. I had a 1969 Dodge Polara, called the four-door Roadrunner. It was built for and sold specifically to law enforcement agencies. I got mine at a state auction where they were auctioning off old patrol cars. It wasn't painted as a cop car, being called an unmarked. It had a 383 interceptor engine with a stock four-barrel car, do 0 to 60 in just over 6 seconds, and be close to 100 and a quarter mile. The specially calibrated torque flight automatic transmission was designed to stand up to the high horsepower and torque. It had heavy-duty suspension and radials tires in a time when they were just getting popular. At first glance, it looked like the kind of full-size four-door car your grandfather would drive. There wasn't a lot I couldn't bust going from stoplight to stoplight. We were in the next town over, cruising the burger joints, checking out girls. Billy was complaining we should have taken his Mustang when a Chevelle pulled up beside us. The guy had three girls with him. It had glass packs and he was revving his engine, laughing. Grandpa know you got his car out. I just smiled, pulled a 20 out of my pocket, held it up, popped it twice so he could see the denomination and laid it on the dash. 20 bucks was serious cash back then, especially to a college student. He was so surprised that when the stoplight changed he missed it, and I pulled sedately away. We could hear the girls laughing. He pulled up beside me again, his pride hurt. You're on, he yelled, putting a 20 on his dash, roaring and popping. He didn't have a chance. When the light changed and I put my foot in that four barrel, we were gone. He was fishtailing while my stabilizer bars kept me right on track. We pulled over in a grocery store parking lot. I can't ducking believe it. What the HLL is this thing? Soon we had the hoods of both popped, swapping stories. It worked out pretty well. He had two extra girls and I had one extra guy. Update 3. It was a warm evening at the beginning of summer. Everybody had their windows down, radio blasting. I was into the cars and didn't pay much attention at first. He was trying to talk me into going to another location. Doing the same thing we had done running me in as a ringer and cleaning up on side bets. Billy was urging me on. He had an eye for the short blonde in the back seat. Come on, I'll ride with them. The other girl can ride with you. Maybe we'll get a little pee out of the deal. I was laughing, saying I bet she was a dog, when the brunette finally got out of the car. She was trying to untangle her mass of waist length, curly hair and pull it back. Hi she said grinning and extending her hand. I'm Sheila. Woof. S-H-T. A stone cold fox had just heard me say she was probably a dog. I went bright red and stuttered while everyone else fell back laughing. She accepted my apology, let me buy her a bottle of wine, and was in the front seat for the rest of the night. The girls were nursing students at our college, which explained why our paths didn't cross before. Billy did indeed get some pee that night, but I didn't. By the time we got back to the apartment they shared with two others, she was passed out. I got to carry her in and put her on the couch. I didn't even get a kiss. The next day she was at my apartment, holding her head. I didn't see anyone else. How did you know where I lived? How did you get here? Still holding her head, she walked by me and lay down on the couch. Sabrina dropped me when she brought Billy home. I felt bad, passing out on you last night. I came by to see if you were as cute sober. Can I have some water and a few aspirin? I got it for her, darkened the shades, and she lay back. She promptly fell asleep. 
She slept for three hours and woke up with a start. Where the HLL am I? I had been in the kitchen, study. You're at my house. Remember me. Sabrina brought you over just before noon. Apparently you needed a little more sleep. She went bright red, then giggled. Well, I guess that'll teach you not to let me drink two bottles of wine. I'm hungry. She used the bathroom, neatened up a bit, and we went to a little place close by. She looked at me. I don't think a greasy burger or pizza would go over too well. That and sandwiches are the extent of my culinary skills. The place was quietly famous for their homemade soups and breads. According to what type soup you ordered, sometimes the loaf was the bowl. It was filling, good, and fairly cheap. She had never been there. Feeling human again, we went to the park and hung out, talking to each other and whatever friends happened by. A couple guys she knew came by with guitars, and we sat around and sang. She had a good voice. It's one of my better memories. I asked her if she was ready to go home and she said she'd like to go back to my place for a while. I had no problem. She made me stop at a store and came back with a 12-a-pack and some chips. We drank two beers when she went into the bathroom. I was surprised when I heard the shower running. Even more surprised when she called out to me. But I was most surprised when she opened the door and stood there. We need towels she said in a calm voice. She turned and walked back towards the shower. I was dumbstruck. You coming or what? It definitely wasn't what. She was the type of woman who inspired so many goofy love songs of that era. We were young, enthusiastic, and soon, in love. It was almost the end of our freshman year, and she lived with me the last four weeks. It was hard on us that first summer, being apart. I stayed in town and worked in the factory. Since Sheila wasn't around I worked massive amounts of overtime. She had already lined up a job at a rest home near her parents to gain nursing experience. She hated it. She came back two weeks early to surprise me. I came in from work and she was sitting on the couch. I didn't want to waste time she said as she dragged me to the shower. I didn't work any more overtime. She moved in, not even pretending to live with her friends. Her parents didn't like it when they found out, but by then most of the year was gone. We lived together all the way through college and a year beyond. It all fell apart in late 1977. I had an entry-level job at a new company. It wasn't really what I wanted, but it would look good on a resume. I worked hard, putting in extra hours, trying to make a good impression. She had a job at the local hospital, general duties mostly, although she liked to work in the birthing rooms and with children. We were in a nice apartment, and she insisted on splitting the bills, minus car payments, so I was saving a good bit, looking to the future. Sooner or later we would want kids, and I wanted a nice place to raise them. Then she suddenly changed to night shift. She said she didn't have a lot of choice. I hated it. We had the evenings together and that was all the contact we had until the weekend. She left at 10, and I was gone when she got home. I didn't have any experience with that sort of things, but the signs were there. Moodiness, disrespect, sometimes she wouldn't be home when I called on my first break. She said she was asleep, a reasonable explanation, but I knew she couldn't go home and go straight to sleep. It usually took her two or three hours to wind down. It came to a head when I proposed. She was shocked. She didn't say no, exactly, but she didn't say yes. Why rush? We're in love, that's not going away. We have plenty of time. We're not rushing, Sheila. We've been together five years. It's time to move to the next phase of our life. Don't you want kids? She fidgeted. Yes, of course I do, but we have plenty of time. We're still young. Let's enjoy each other a bit longer. I thought for a second. Let me get this straight in my mind. You say we'll marry, but not right now. We'll have kids, someday, on your schedule. Where is this coming from? Sounds like you have doubts about spending the rest of our lives together. Anything else on your mind I need to know about? She burst into tears and hid in the bedroom. Things went downhill pretty fast. I came home a month later to find her moved out. She left a letter. Dear Roy, please don't be mad. I've been feeling restless lately, like I'm missing something. I've talked to my friends, and I've decided I need a little space. I need to find myself before I can commit to a lifelong relationship. I still love you. Please, give me this time. I'll be back before you know it. I was heartbroken. Then I was angry. We still had a lot of friends in common, and soon word got back to me. She was finding herself with the help of one of the doctors she worked with. She would call me, and I would hang up. I know, childish. I didn't care. She saw me at a club and was angry beyond words I was there with a date. She was with friends, and they tried to keep us apart, which was fine by me. My new girlfriend saw the stairs and I filled her in without going into to detail. She was a little redhead, with a temper of her own. Want a little payback? Of course I did. She hung on to me like I was the last drink of water in a desert, and I let her. People didn't bump and grind back then like they do now, 
so it got a lot of attention when we slow danced and she practically dry humped me on the dance floor. That tore it with Sheila. She charged over with a full head of steam. What the duck do you think you're doing? I'm going through issues and you're running around with slot S. That's not how it works. You can't do that. How's that helping us get back together? It was a golden opportunity and I was was young and petty enough to take it. Who said we're getting back together? I love you for five years and suddenly it's not enough. Have you found yourself yet? I bet if you look hard enough at the end of Dr. Love's Sea, you'll at least see part of you. Didn't know I knew about that, did you? Now leave me alone. I'd tell you to go get duck at, but you already did. She went pale and collapsed. I left and didn't see her again for two years. When I say left, I mean left town. I got a better job offer in another state and took it. I didn't tell anybody until the day before I left. I had a big party and invited my oldest friends. They were shocked when I told them it was my farewell party. Late in the evening Sabrina and Billy got me alone. What did Sheila say when you told her? I was surprised. I haven't seen or talked to her in almost two months. Why should it matter? Sabrina snorted. I admit it. She was a BTCH. How she left you was bad and ducking that doctor was even worse. But since that night at the club all she does when she isn't working is sit around and mope about you. She made a mistake, screwed up bad. I know for a fact she would do anything for a chance to start over with you. Can't you at least say bye? I shook my head. Already said bye. Tell her this though. Stop moping around. Put a little energy into the relationship with doctor. See she'll be happier. She almost slapped me, but I caught her hand. She hasn't seen him since the night she saw you with that redhead. Besides, he's married. There was never a future there. That tidbit just angry me off more. So she was ducking the guy knowing he was married. That solidifies her standing as a certified slot in my mind. I'm sorry, Sabrina, there's nothing left anymore. I wasn't taking anything but clothes with me and made a deal with a few college guys to take what they wanted, as long as they cleaned the place out and left it good order. Billy supervised. He said I hadn't been gone five minutes when Sabrina came by with Sheila. She saw the stuff piled outside and threw a fit, screaming, grabbing things and trying to take them back inside. They finally got her calmed down. I had left everything that was hers or that I thought she might want with Billy anyway, so she had nothing to complain about. She sat there and cried while the physical remnants of our life together disappeared. Update 4. I finished our saga in a joint session. So you see, Dr. Wills, there was a precedent for her recent behavior. And it makes me wonder, in between then and now, had she gotten lost again? Was I living in a fool's paradise while she found herself with other doctors? Looking back, I can remember a few rough patches. Sheila denied that violently, but wouldn't look me in the eye. And apparently, her version of our history had been revised a bit to put her in a better light. Dr. Wills was not happy. In my next individual session she asked me how we got back together. I was doing well in my new job. It looked like I might have a future there. I took two weeks vacation and went home to see my mother. She had remarried, a decent guy. We had nothing in common except love for my mother, but it was enough for us to become friends. I spent four days with them and enjoyed it tremendously. My old college town was between my new town and my old one. I had stopped for gas and went to see if the little cafe that served such great soup was still there. It was. I had just started eating when someone slapped me on the back of my head. I looked around and found Billy and Sabrina. That's for not keeping in touch, as Hole said Sabrina, as they sat down. We caught up. They had married and had just found out they were going to be parents. Their joy had me smiling. We talked for a bit, and they asked if I was going to be in town for any length of time. No, I'm on my vacation, passing through on the way to my visit my mom. But I'll be back this way at the end of the week, maybe we can get together then. I called as soon as I got back into town and checked in. We met with a few old friends that night, with a promise to get back together the next day. Billy and Sabrina had a nice home. Three bedrooms, with a large yard. It was a little older, but they loved it. They had tables set up, party lights strung through the trees, the stereo pulled outside and hooked to extra speakers, and three grills going. There was about 40 people there, old classmates and their spouses or partners of the moment. I knew almost everybody, and eventually we did the marriage count. All but me and two others were married. Two had married and already gotten divorced. So, is there a Mrs. Roy in the near future? It was an innocent question but one that still brought me pain while I looked at my old friends. No, no prospects at this time. I see a few, but nothing serious. To be honest, I haven't been looking. You know how my last serious relationship ended up. Let's say I'm just a bit cautious these days. It cast a little pall over the group until they started the confess game. I wasn't familiar. We pull situations out of a hat, and you have to tell a true story about that situation if you've been in it. It's fun, 
and you don't have to play, and we try not to keep it too personal. The object is to laugh, not embarrass. We usually ask three people, then draw another subject. All right. I agreed and they began. The first question, what was the craziest place or situation you had sex in? Everybody looked at me. Gee, there's been so many, which should I choose? That brought a round of laughter. All right, it was just before I came here to college. I bet you all thought I was a virgin, huh? I'm from a small town. The hot spots for a teenager were the drive-in burger joints, the movies, and the bowling lanes. That was pretty much the nightlife. Moo friend Joe and I were cruising around in his car, a 67 Barracuda. Man, I would have loved to own that car. It was jet black and had that big bubble back window. Anybody remember those? There was a few nods form the guys. Anyway, Joe and I cruised the bowling alley parking lot and hooked up with two girls from the other high school in the county. He had a hot car. I was 18, legal age at the time, so I had a case of beer, and it wasn't long until we were out in the country, riding the back roads. We parked, drank half the case, and pretty soon we were necking like crazy. I had my hands all over her beat and she seemed to like it. Then the cops came by, and we had to leave. Joe was be teaching, because where he had to stop, me and the girl I was with were getting deeper into it. Dot dot dot. So there you have it. The most unusual place I ever had sex in, the back of a 67 Barracuda in the bowling alley parking lot, in front of a crowd. I was actually a bit of a legend in my school for a few weeks. Most of them were laughing so hard they had tears in their eyes. I was laughing along until I looked up, right into Sheila's eyes. I stopped laughing instantly. Sabrina saw me and grabbed my hand. Behave, I didn't know she would be here. I sent out a grapevine invitation, and she's still my friend. I smiled. No problem, the past is in the past. I'm content to leave it there. She smiled and turned away, but I could have sworn I heard her mumble maybe for you, but I couldn't be sure. She didn't approach me for about an hour, but I felt her eyes on me constantly. Soon everyone was watching us instead of partying. Enough was enough. I walked up to her. She had a look in her eye halfway between hope and terror. Hi, Sheila. I like your hair. She had a shorter, more professional cut, much different from the flowing mane she had when we were together. She automatically stroked it. You don't think it makes me look older. I laughed, and everybody else did when they heard me. Duh, of course it does. The fact that you are older has nothing to do with it. I glanced at her hand. I couldn't help it. No rings. She noticed it and smiled for the first time. She rubbed my face. I could say the same for you. When did you get rid of the beard? And that's the shortest I've ever seen your hair. I had to grow up. Owners aren't comfortable when their managers look like John Lennon. My cheek felt like it was on fire where she touched it. Everybody relaxed and went back to partying. She followed me around so I stopped trying to ditch her. You wanna talk? She said out of the blue. About what? I said, knowing the answer. About us. About how bad I screwed up. About letting me apologize for the horrible way I treated you. I sighed. There is no us anymore, Sheila. You did treat me horribly, and I do accept that you feel bad about it. But I can never trust you again, so let's just try to remember the good times. She tried not to, but tears rolled down her cheeks. She disappeared for a while. I got drunk. Not high, not tipsy, me walking drunk. About halfway and I felt someone slip under my arm and I clung to them blindly. Billy drove me back to the motel. He and a helper got me inside and undressed. You're on your own from here I heard him say right before I passed out. The last thing I heard was a woman saying she could handle it. I felt like toasted SHT when I woke up later. It didn't help much. Man, do I hate hangovers. I finally pried my eyes open and got them to focus. Then I shook my head, thinking I was seeing things. That made it hurt even worse. When I got my head cleared again, I saw the same thing. Sheila, sitting cross-legged on the bed. What happened? She had a sad look in her eyes. You tried to drink me away last night. Didn't work. I'm here, and I'm not going anywhere until we talk. But first, you need a shower pretty bad. I hope you got enough towels. I watched that great as I remembered so well sway across the room. She looked over her shoulder at me in the door. You common, or what? It wasn't what. We didn't do anything. I was in no shape. Neither of us bothered dressing. Just went back to bed. As my head cleared, we talked. Actually she talked about her life for the last two years. About how sorry she was for what she did to me. How she had gone to some counseling sessions the hospital provided free to staff. It made her realize she was afraid of commitment. To put it in plain terms, I didn't want to grow up. While we were in college it was like we were safe from the real world. The last year, when we were actually adults, started me retreating. She rubbed my cheek again. But don't worry, my act of stupidity made me grow up pretty fast, especially since I didn't have you to run home to. I had to put on the big girl panties and deal with it. And I did. I'm all grown up now, Roy. 
Please, let me prove it to you. I finally worked enough energy up to eat something. She refused to leave my side. I think she would have stood outside the men's room door if she could, to make sure I didn't slip away. I asked her about nine what time she had to be home. When you throw me out. Not a minute before. So she stayed. We made love. It was everything I remembered. Actually, it was better. Maybe she was trying to prove something to us or herself, but it was more intense, more intimate. We didn't get back together right away. It took months, because I wouldn't be rushed. If it had been up to her, we would have married that first weekend. But we did, and two years later our son came along. And I lived, for the most part, in happiness and love, until it came apart again. Update 5 Sheila had moved back into the house by now. She tried through various sources, but didn't find out where I lived until after the divorce. All the paperwork originated and was sent from an address off the YCDT Corporation. My entertainment lawyer set it up, and when he had me name it, he asked what the initials meant. Does it matter? No, not really, just wondered. She and her lawyer almost went into shock over the financial disclosures. It included half the profits from the first two books to date, as well as half the movie rights. In the end, a major film company outbid everyone else at $1.3 million, with a flyer saying that if the movie grossed over a certain amount, I would get a percentage. It came down to almost $700,000 apiece after tax, and as a bonus, she got the house and I kept health insurance on her until she was 62. I kept the retirement from my old company, and she kept hers. It was as fair as I can make it. She still fought every step of the way. The arbitrator was about to throw up his hands when she wanted alimony for 10 years. Please, Mrs. Smith, be realistic. The marriage is over. All your tactics are doing is delaying the inevitable. He's been more than fair. If you add in the house, you're getting more than half the assets. He obviously wants you to live in comfort. I had a quick conference with Becky. She was about to disagree but saw the look on my face. All right, she said. Coming back into the room, this is it, my client's final offer. She can have all the revenues of the first two books for the next three years in lieu of any alimony. This is our final offer. Refuse, and we go away, and let arbitration lapse. You can take him to court. I'll make sure to fight you tooth and nail for years over every little item. He's got the deep pockets, you don't. You don't have the money right now to pay your lawyer. His fee is contingent on the settlement. How long do you think he's going to fight for you if his paycheck is years in the future? I hope you fight, now. I have a college education to pay for starting next year. Sheila looked at me, pleading. It had been nine months and the pain for both of us was still there. She nodded her head. Forty-five days later we were no longer man and wife. Update 6. I turned 62 yesterday. I'm officially old. I lay in bed, head slightly aching, really glad I don't drink much anymore, and thought about my life post-marriage. I finally got famous enough people would recognize me. I had written six books so far. Three bestsellers, two good ones, and one I'm surprised got published. It sold well enough anyway. Two were made into motion pictures. One was turned into a miniseries on television. Money kept rolling in. Kelsey surprised me by enrolling in a state university 30 miles away and living with me for two years. She just moved out a few months ago into an apartment with her boyfriend. I got a housekeeper who complained I didn't dirty enough to keep her busy. He practically lives in that basement office of his and he won't let me in there except once a week. When Kelsey moved in she had a lot to do because there was always a girl or two there just for the night. She actually enjoyed it. Two weeks before the decree became final, I had my first sexual encounter with someone I hadn't been married to for 32 years. She was a recently divorced woman of 50. She looked good but I was warned by my friends. We know who you are now, and you have to be making good money off those books. She's looking for a sugar daddy and thinks you're it. I didn't care when she came on to me, I was back in college again. She was good. It was like she was auditioning, eager, willing to do anything. Her disappointment in me not moving her in a month later was hard for me to bear but I dealt with it. Luckily, the bar of the country club had a full contingent of cougars and I slept alone by choice most of the time. I even had a few of Kelsey's little friends warm up to me. There's lots of old fools out there, but I like to think I wasn't one of them. Right now I'm seeing my new neighbor. She's my age and looks much younger. Of course, she told me she was heavily into yoga and had been for two years. Her therapist recommended it as a way to center herself and she fell in love with it. She tries to get me to do it with her, but I like my machines just fine. I have to admit I do admire her flexibility, though. I watched as her house got built across the cove from me. A simple house, compared to the McMansions that had been popping up. A single-story three-bedroom cottage, with an extensive outdoor living area. When it was almost done Kelsey took the canoe I kept in the boathouse, and paddled over. 
She had been grinning like mad for the last three months, happy over her new boyfriend, I guess. She came back and hugged me. I met our new neighbor. You'd like her. She's divorced, close to your age. But she's got a tight body and a cute face. We should invite her over. I was right in the middle of finishing my last book and was concentrating on that, so I just nodded. I could entertain later. The new house was finished and our neighbor moved in. I was out in my pontoon early one morning, working the cove, trying to catch dinner. I saw her on the patio and got out my binoculars. She was on a mat, moving her body through a series of motions that were sensual. I didn't get a look at her face. It was obscured by a mass of silver hair that looked familiar somehow. Maybe I would invite her over some night for dinner. Got a bit of a look at our new neighbor this morning. Maybe we should be nice and invite her to dinner, you know, be neighborly. Kelsey sat and grinned at me. There's no horn dog like an old horn dog. I pretended to be offended. She grinned harder. Tell you what, I'll invite her to your birthday party next week. You know, meet her in a casual setting. I've already told you I don't want a party. Doesn't matter. The sad fact is when people get old and see now the youngsters can push them around. Besides, I've already invited people. Just a few. So that Friday afternoon I was out on the patio, mixing with friends and well-wishers. Becky was there with her family. We had remained friends, and her daughter was a fixture at my house, going to the same college as Kelsey. My son and his new wife, my ex-daughter-in-law and her new husband. All I need now is Sheila, I thought sadly. My butcher was there, beaming at the compliments to the meat. We had become golfing buddies. A select few of my country club friends and their wives, about 40 people in all. Shorts, tees, sandals. They were admiring the pool Kelsey made me put in. You didn't really expect me to swim in the lake, did you? Thinking of her, I looked around. She wasn't to be found. I think she took the pontoon to fetch your new neighbor said Becky, grinning. I hear she has a pretty good body. Probably a dog I said sourly. You're about to find out. Here they come. I turned and watched as Kelsey led the woman up from the dock. Leggy, thin with good curves, she had a halter and cutoffs on. The halter was straining against the bottom of her breasts as she was taking down her hair. It was oddly familiar. She was taking her oversized sunglasses off as they reached us. Gramps, she fussed, you know how sound carries over water. We heard what you said. You need to apologize. I flushed with embarrassment as I turned. Before I could say anything she pushed the hair out of her eyes and held out her hand. Hi she said, I'm Sheila. Woof. Final update, yes, Sheila, my ex. Live and in person. You're my new neighbor. Her smile faltered a bit. Then she continued like we had never met. Yes I am. My granddaughter lives up her and I fell in love with the place. I've been divorced for a couple of years and I recently retired. My ex had made a little money and he was more generous than I deserved. I got a good deal on the lot and built the house I always wanted. She hesitated again. Please Roy. There was nothing left for me back there. I sold the house. I'm trying to move on with my life. I won't bother you. Won't come over uninvited. Kelsey is here. You're here. I don't want to be far away. I gave up. She acknowledged the compliments on her new look, talking about how much therapy and yoga had helped. Two of the women I had dated in the past was there, and when introductions were made, they circled each other like mature cats, taking measure. In the end Sheila smiled. She was more attractive and in much better shape, and they knew it. Becky was laughing her as off. Did you know about this? No, but Roy, you got to admit, she really looks good. I sighed. She always looked good, to me. Didn't stop her from doing what she did. Sheila was behind us. She stood, let a tear slide down her cheek, then retreated to the bathroom, repaired her makeup, and came back smiling. We ate. We carried on like the friends we were. Somewhere along the line she had attached herself to me and didn't leave. Finally it was just Becky, her husband, her daughter, Kelsey and her boyfriend, me, and Sheila. Our son and ex-wife were in bed with their spouses, staying the night. Roy, I'd like to call it an evening. Will you take me home now? We walked down to the pontoon and took the short ride across the cove without talking. Will you escort me in, at least to the door, so I can set the security system? I walked her in. She showed me the place with pride, talking about the features she had incorporated. It was simple and tastefully furnished. I complimented her. I'm happy here, she said simply. She made coffee. I drank a cup and started for the door. I got almost there when she said in a small voice stay. Sheila, that isn't a good idea. Please, I won't read anything into it. I know we're done. We'll never be man and wife again. Just for tonight. Consider it a birthday present or comfort for a friend. Please. I knew, absolutely knew I should walk away, but I turned and took her in my arms. She was energetic, familiar but different. Everything was firmer than I remembered. For an official old guy, I didn't do too badly. I woke the next morning with her in my arms, her eyes on me. Morning. 
Good morning. Worried about last night. I thought for a minute. Yes, don't be. Like I said last night, we'll never be man and wife again. I'm not good wife material. It's a fact I had to face in my therapy. But I bet I'd make a pretty good girlfriend. One that would want her own place and privacy from time to time. I wouldn't even care if we were exclusive. I just want a place in your life again, and maybe in your heart. Think about it. All this was said in gaps as she nibbled her way down my stomach. Just before she reached the point of interest she popped her head out of the covers, smiling. I had forgotten I never told her. Why CDT? You can't do that. She did things she had never done before. I didn't care. I had learned a few tricks myself. We lay together later, snuggling. She jumped up suddenly. I want you to return the favor, but I definitely need a shower. I watched her still magnificent as sway across the bedroom. At the door she looked over her shoulder. You common, or what? It wasn't what? Epilogue. I know, I know, you BTB guys are screaming in your heads not to get tangled up with her. But you know, I've never responded well when I'm told I can't do something. But like she said, she wasn't marriage material, even if I was to get stupid enough to want to. I had come to like variety and wasn't inclined to relinquish it. Friends with benefits, duck buddies, whatever. I knew it would be more than that, but not much more. It still burns her up when I have a female guest stay overnight. I've even caught her watching us through binoculars a couple of times. She'll mope around for a day or two, then come over and do her yoga routine behind the walled section of my patio. Life is good. Thanks for reading. Remember, revolving time exists because of your support, and I want it to be a place where we can all come together, learn, and have a great time. Your feedback is vital, and I appreciate every single suggestion and comment you provide. Take care yourself and see you soon.